Hello everyone, this is Adil Maya from the University of Waterloo. I am presenting today a research theme that based on my experience in both engineering and medical fields, and uh, we are going to use it for material characterization and, and resolving some of the medical issues. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the contribution, the help, and support of many people at the University of Waterloo and at uh, the Princess Margaret uh, Hospital. Uh, in particular, my uh, students at the University of Waterloo, in addition to my colleagues and my uh, former supervisor, Professor Sutki, late Professor Sutki and Professor Plumtree, at the, at the Princess Margaret Hospital, I'd like to acknowledge the contribution of Dr. Uh, Christy Brock, who helped me to navigate into the medical field and integrate the mechanical aspect into medical application. In addition, I'd like to acknowledge the contribution and the funding from INSERT, CFI, University of Waterloo, in addition to the support in the medical field, uh, NIH, Cancer Care Ontario, and Terry Fox uh, Foundation. The presentation, in fact, is more of a story of an idea traveled from engineering, uh, in particular from structural engineering, to the medical field. Uh, to be specific, in the, in the cancer radiotherapy application and coming back to the engineering uh, enriched by uh, the experience we gained from the medical field and we used it for a wide range of application including the material characterization. We'll present the structural part where the ideas start to evolve where we investigate the carbon fiber reinforced polymer in a pre-stress concrete application, will address in particular the anchor design to grip the CFRP rod, or recently that we developed as well, the plate, CFRP plate or rod for pre-stress concrete application. And this comes after the interfacial mechanics of metal uh, and composite couples. Then we'll move to medical application where we use biomechanics for radiotherapy application, although different, uh, different organs being investigated, but uh, we are going to focus on the lung sliding to treat uh, lung cancer using radiotherapy. And finally, the idea coming back to the material characterization where we use image, in addition to mechanics integration, so IMI is, is the lab that we establish as well at the University of Waterloo to do the material investigation and material characterization. Let's start with the structural engineering application. As you know, one of the challenges that facing our structure is the corrosion problem that results in uh, deterioration of our structures. So a carbon fiber reinforced polymer, CFRP, uh, is a composite material that uh, has a, a potential to be a good candidate for pre-stressing material uh, for concrete applications. The CFRP's potential for pre-stressing application stems from the fact that it is a corrosion resistant material. Also, it is uh, high strength material. Therefore, if you compare the strength to weight ratio of CFRP to other material that is shown to the right side of the slide, you will realize that using the same ratio for all these beams, the CFRP has the highest value of the strength to weight ratio, which means we're going to end up with uh, lightweight material for structures. And this can be compared even to GFRP and for regular steel that being used in structure. In addition to that, for a structure that experience cyclic loading, for example, bridges, 
the CFRB has an excellent fatigue resistance in compared to many other materials. So if you look at the lower right side of the slide, you will realize that the carbon fiber has a very good uh, uh, fatigue resistant. Yes, aluminum has a uh, higher value in some part of the uh, cycle uh, or life of the materials, but you, as you know, aluminum, its strength uh, and also uh, the galvanic uh, corrosion potential makes it not an ideal material for pre-stressing application. So we are going to focus on the application of CFRP in structures. Yes, the CFRP has some disadvantages, including the high cost associated with the material cost. However, if you consider the long term low cost of maintenance, uh, the CFRP presents itself as a viable material for pre-stress application. Also, it has some a problem regarding the, uh, its sensitivity to the stress in the lateral direction. So this which makes it a bit challenged to apply the gripping at the end. So the gripping means you will have high uh, con high lateral load at the uh, ends to apply pre-stressing in addition to high pre-stressing stress. So there you will have high tensile, high contact in the lateral uh, direction will end up with a premature failure. So this is what we are going to focus on solving this issue to utilize the full material potential of carbon fiber as far as the tensile strength is concerned. So now the challenge is to find the anchor system that can be used to avoid the premature failure of the CFRP plate. So there are a number of uh, systems being developed to avoid this or to overcome the, uh, the sensitivity of CFRP to lateral loading, including epoxy potted anchor, which uh, the CFRP rod or plate put inside the cylinder and then filled with epoxy and uh, left for uh, hours to be treated, to be hardened before it's been applied. So this is epoxy potted anchor, which result in a large uh, system in addition to long curing time that's required for the, uh, before the application. On the other side, we have what we call in the pre-stress uh, concrete chucks or wedge anchors. But this wedge anchor used in steel cannot be used in, in CFRB due to the material differences. So what we've done here, we applied uh, a sleeve, a uh, soft material sleeve, in this case is copper, and we have the wedges in addition to the barrel that we uh, designed a compact, reusable, and easy to assemble um, anchor. Without going into the detail, we've done interfacial mechanics study, basically CFRP metal couple and the metal couple here is the uh, sleeve and then we move to the anchor design just to connect between whatever we applied in the structure and what we're going to apply in the medical field How we did the, the interfacial studies, we basically did a friction test where we have a sleeve on a rod and then a clamp between uh, two uh, clamping plate and then we pull the uh, rod out of this sleeve. So basically we are going to uh, uh, see the contact pressure effect and we are going to see how 
much the resistance of slipping of the CFRB from the uh, sleep. From the relationship basically between the contact pressure, the normal pressure, and the shear stress, which is longitudinal to the applied to the fibers. And we realize that the soft copper providing a very important or higher shear stress than the hard copper. Basically, good grip in, in other uh, words. Now, after the interfacial mechanics, we got the result that we needed, specifically the friction we need. And then we apply it for the anchor design and we use finite element mathematical modeling. And I'll give you a glimpse of what we have done. We are not the first people who investigated the design for, of anchor system for CFRP rod. For example, the one in the middle using differential angle between the, uh, the housing barrel, what we call it, and the wedges uh, is done at the University of Calgary. And the two on the sides are done by us. So one in the, to the far left is variable barrel thickness where we cut the some of the thickness at the uh, loading end, what we call it, where the high tensile stress exists, but it seemed to be, it, it didn't work well. And then we modify our design using uh, what we call it circular profile, uh, i.e. we have uh, cut the wedges and the barrel into a circle to minimize the contact pressure. A finite element model, three-dimensional finite element, was developed to investigate the stress distribution inside the carbon fiber and other components, where we apply three interfacial surfaces between the carbon fiber and the sleeve, and between the sleeve and the wedge, and between the wedge and uh, the barrel. And then we investigated this distribution when we apply the tensile load uh, uh, inside the CFRB rod in this case. Here, the contact pressure distribution along the anchor, uh, starting from the left where the loading end, what we call it, where the tensile load is applied, and far right, which is the free end. So this is in particular on the CFRB rod. So the contact pressure distribution on the CFRB rod. And here you will f see the three anchor system we presented earlier. Variable barrel thickness didn't work that we developed. Uh, differential angles uh, work well. And uh, however, it's not enough to minimize the stress at the contact pressure at the uh, loading end here the goal is to minimize the contact pressure at the far right and uh, far left end which is where the tensile stress is at its highest level and then uh, the presented one which is the circular profile where we cut the the wedges and uh, and barrel using a circular profile which give us a very uh, good reduction of the contact pressure at the loading end, which make the uh, anchor system a successful, in this case, using the circular profile. Take the design of the anchor system and we uh, test it. And we test the slipping as well using LVDT. And we have at the top end is the tested anchor. And the bottom end is the just a long, uh, uh, relatively long uh, clamping system. Is the displacement of the rod and, uh, as the tensile load increase, and we are able to reach the guaranteed tensile strength of the CFRP rod and exceed it a bit. And we use the circular profile anchor system that we uh, proposed.
here is some of the application of the anchor rod for rods uh, in uh, Canada and US. This anchor system uh, for the CFRP rods has been used in uh, many research projects here at the University of Waterloo and in other universities for the strengthening application uh, and in addition to other uh, uh, fittings such as uh, uh, near surface mounting. Recently we developed uh, an anchor system, mechanical anchor system, similar to the circular profile one with some modification to the geometry, of course, uh, in addition to the number of wedges and other components that make this anchor very suitable to carbon fiber reinforced plate. And we are very successful in that we reach the ultimate tensile strength of the plate without a premature failure. The, one of the advantages of using this kind of anchor as well uh, as its compact uh, uh, size, it's easy to apply and easy to reinstall and no need for a curing time as we see for the epoxy potted anchor. So this is a new development that we reached recently. One of the main uh, motivation for the anchor for CFRP plate uh, project is to uh, minimize the peeling failure of the CFRB used for the strengthening and rehabilitation application. And also to make it easy uh, to install this anchor to the surface uh, by having this small anchor system to fit into small sizes where in many cases the space is not available for larger uh, anchor as you can see in some of these uh, uh, images presented in this slide. So as presented earlier, there is rod anchor system, circular rod anchor system and uh, plate anchor system. Both of them are successful and, and basically it's almost similar theme used in the in both of the design where we did the interfacial mechanics and we moved to the finite element and we end up with the testing. So the rod anchor system being uh, able to carry the full tensile strength and the plate anchor as well and the rod anchor being used in the field and in uh, also in the lab work. However, for the plate anchor, we just finalized the uh, lab test and we are successful in reaching the full tensile strength of the plate and uh, tested in the lab um, for uh, strengthening application in particular for the slab, uh, or concrete slab application. Now the uh, idea that we got from structural engineering, including interfacial mechanics in addition to the modeling techniques, it moves to the medical application. So here we will use it in particular for the radiotherapy application using mechanics and will integrate imaging as well in this uh, application. One of the methods that's been widely used in cancer treatment is radiotherapy. This radiotherapy, it has to be conformal treatment, i.e. limited to the cancer tumor uh, to avoid any damage to the healthy tissue. The process of radiotherapy starts with planning, which has a lot of images, MRI, CT, and others. And then it moved to treatment. The treatment can continue for five day, five weeks, uh, and the patient comes almost every day except the weekend. And here you cannot uh, image the patient using CT every day. However, there are X-ray, very simple X-ray, cone beam CT that's been used for this uh, process, which helps a lot too 
locate the tumor during every session. So here, let's see, uh, the same plan is used during the course of treatment. Uh, the radiotherapy starting with the planning stage where the CT images and CT PET or MRI uh, being used for the plan and then the plan moved to the uh, treatment unit or to what we call it LINAC and to the far uh, right of the slide and the LINAC uh, has been provided with uh, comb beam CT uh, it's uh, low quality imaging, not on the one that similar to the one that used in the planning to minimize the radiation basically to the patients. So we use the planning images, the good quality images, and incorporate it in order to create the finite element model that you see in here. So why are we using finite element? This is basically what we call image registration. Image registration, we have rigid image registration when there is uh, no movement or deformation in the organ. But this is not true because it is most of the organs are deformable. So uh, for example, the lung experience large deformation between inhale and exhale. So you will find this is very obvious. Uh, the error of the red contour, uh, which represent the uh, cancer between inhale and exhale is not the same. So we are missing a lot of the tumor area. So biomechanical model being used to do what we call a deformable image registration. In order to create uh, an accurate finite, finite element model, you need uh, uh, realistic model represented by the realistic geometry, uh, realistic interaction and boundary condition, materials, properties, and heterogeneity as well. And don't forget, we need it to be efficient in order to do the treatment in uh, a very short time. Accurate geometry can be obtained using CT images, in this case for the lung case, and we create the finite element using uh, basically stitching the uh, stack of 2D images that's been provided by the CT. One of my main contribution to the deformable image registration using finite element modeling is the integration of the interfacial mechanics into the modeling of the lungs and other organs that we model. For example, the sliding of the lungs uh, relative to the chest cavity. This is very important aspect for the functions of the organs. Uh, to make them able to move relative to their surroundings, such as the chest cavity walls in the case of the lungs. This sliding limits both lungs and chest wall from any distortions and also from anatomy uh, point of view, lungs are surrounded by two layers uh, of a plural. And um, these pleura separated by very thin uh, pleural liquid, which functions as uh, a lubricant to minimize any uh, surface abrasion and also in addition to the distortion that we mentioned earlier. So basically, including the uh, sliding model for the finite and the finite element model. Uh, for the lungs is part of the realistic modeling. And in fact, it minimizes the error of image registration uh, in a very significant way. One of the main characteristics of the sliding surfaces at the interfacial uh, contact surface is the coefficient of friction. In the case of the lung, this coefficient of friction is very low, ranging in fact between 0.02 and 0.08. Uh, 
this is mainly due to the existence of the pleural liquid between the chest cavity and the lungs. However, due to the application of the uh, radiotherapy, the viscosity of the pleural liquid can change and changing with it the coefficient of uh, friction level. Uh, so we model, actually, we take a number of coefficient of friction and we see which one is the providing us with the best accurate representation of the lungs sliding relative to the chest cavity. So the main difference between the contact surface and non-contact surface, the, and the non-contact surface model that uh, frequently used in literature, that the nodes of the chest cavity is fully attached to the node of the uh, uh, lungs, which is not realistic due to the existence of the pleural liquid. So what has been added here is adding the contact surface. Basically, the lungs node moves separately from the chest cavity nodes. The material properties of the lungs tissues as been uh, reported by the experimental work done in 1987, it is similar to the properties of rubber, i.e. Uh, it is hyperelastic material. So it is nonlinear properties. And uh, the stress strain curve therefore need to be represented by one of the many hyperelastic model available in the literature. In this case, we use the experiment, we fit it into a specific uh, function, hyperelastic function, Marlow, and we apply it in the finite element model to see the effect of the nonlinearity. Uh, properties of the lens on the accuracy of the deformable image registration. Just to provide an idea how the model is being created and the model created by using the inhale images creating a surface and the excel image creating another surface projecting these surfaces to create uh, to find the difference between the two to apply the boundary condition for the finite element model and then we use the contact surface between the lung and the chest cavity in order to uh, uh, to model the sliding uh, the lung has bronchial uh, trees and addition to the parenchyma uh, so uh, including all of these in the model will result in the actual finite element however we realize later on that the bronchiolic tree effect is very minimal on the accuracy of the model here is the uh, model of the lungs left and right lungs and then model of the tumor and the body the tumor is in the middle tested on seven patients in the beginning the red spot is the tumor in each of these patients in order to check the accuracy of the finite element model a, a, a bifurcation point is being used a number of them on average 45 for each patient it's the intersection between the two bronchial tree we trace it in inhale and exhale using images so we get image based distance and then we take the same point we check the distance between inhale and exhale and the finite element so the difference between the two is the error basically uh, the slice different between the slide distance between the images is 2.5 millimeter in the medical field it's smaller in the material uh, uh, ct we're going to check later on and so our criteria of success need to be two, less than 2.5 focusing on the super inferior direction i.e top bottom 
a direction where the most of the movement of the breathing occurs and we get it in where the most error occurs as well. Um, so we consider elastic model hyperelastic with uh, friction and uh, different Poisson's ratio on the uh, top uh, of the on the top of the table. So we reach a point where we said that uh, the friction less contact pressure using hyperelastic is an efficient because it provides the least or the minimal error of registration. So the optimum model is basically the hyperelastic material application using compressibility or Poisson's ratio 0.4 and a frictionless contact surface being applied on a number, limited number of patients being transferred later on to uh, a very large population of patients in order to check uh, the accuracy. Due to the existence of a bronchial tree inside the lungs, material heterogeneity were, was investigated by modeling tubes, the bronchial, actual bronchial trees inside the lung for patient-specific models. And uh, the result was is not that uh, much different from using homogeneous one and remember we need the accuracy of 2.5 millimeter however the impact of using the bronchial tree or modeling the bronchial tree on the comput computational time is very significant how the bronchial tree is being modeled so we take the optimal model that we mentioned earlier for the of the lung homogeneous lungs and then we take the image of the specific patients and then we threshold the bronchial tree uh, thresholding is uh, important here because as you know the uh, bronchial tree is stiffer than the rest of the lung and we include, we model them as shell element inside the uh, lungs using different modulus of elasticity. Here is an example of deforming uh, the bronchial tree due to the breathing uh, of a patient and the deformation of these uh, shell elements and tubes of the bronchial tree inside uh, the lungs. Comparing the results of different patients using homogeneous versus a bronchial tree with different stiffness, you can tell from the uh, bottom uh, uh, row that the difference is not that significant in terms of the accuracy. However, as I mentioned earlier, the timing of computation is very uh, significant when it comes to homogeneous versus uh, heterogeneous uh, models. So three days versus uh, for the uh, for the element with bronchial tree versus around uh, minutes actually in, uh, in using homogeneous models. So as a conclusion for the lung uh, models, sliding model improved accuracy and homogeneity is a reasonable assumption in modeling lung deformation. And here we, I use reasonable assumption because the accuracy was not affected that much using the uh, bifurcation point checking that we uh, performed. After this successful adventure in the medical field of a mechanical uh, idea, basically interfacial mechanics, and now it's been used widely in the uh, clinics around the world, uh, we moved the technique to uh, material and engineering application using imaging and image-based model. A lab has been established around eight years ago to integrate image mechanics to 
uh, characterize the material or investigate the internal structure to track the cracks and so on inside the material. So it's provide 3D imaging. However, the difference between this CT imaging that's shown in the in the picture and uh, another uh, CT imaging system used in the medical field, the high resolution and high power of the system. So this system has power of 240 kV, i.e. it can penetrate steel and concrete. And also the resolution is micro scale. So instead of uh, millimeters in, uh, in the medical field application. Um, basically for the health uh, related CT is to minimize the radiation applied to patients. But here uh, the solid elements or uh, non-living samples can be uh, radiated or imaged with high power. So here is the CT is being used in the application. A wide range of material being investigated in the lab, but I'm going to give you the uh, concrete cylinder with corroded bar example, and later on I give you an, a list of the rest of the some of the material we investigated. So here is the 3D images of the concrete with the bar. Uh, to the right, we do void analysis. This is, we focus on the large voids here inside the concrete sample. So this is the color based on the size of the uh, void uh, inside the sample. Also, we were able to track the corrosion product distribution inside the concrete and to see how and where the limit of the corrosion effect inside the concrete. So this is one of the unique application of the uh, using this. Another thing that we did with the corroded bar is to track the cracking inside the concrete. And now it's underway actually to investigate um, the smallest crack and where it starts and during the corrosion process. And so this is giving us the three dimensional of crack distribution and the timing of a crack during the corrosion process. So we didn't stop at investigating the cracks, where is it, where start and how many cracks and voids as well. We uh, extend our uh, work to transfer the actual uh, sample of the concrete into finite element model. This, each model, will include the cement, the aggregate, the void, the steel, and all the other components that whatever component inside the concrete, we, uh, we include it in the finite element model. Also, the interaction between aggregate and cement, so there is a contact surface applied there. It's a huge model, but it gives us an idea to see where the crack initiated, and we connected all these dots, or the result of the finite element, to the experimental one and to the imaging one. So we'll take the image and we transfer the image to finite element model and we apply the load based on the type of loading. It's compression, in this case, is going to be the expansion of the, con of the, uh, uh, of the corrosion product. And here we use as well extended finite element to, to track the cracks at the inside the concrete uh, cylinder. We expanded our corrosion investigation using imaging, imaging and mechanics to the naturally corroded uh, elements. And we got a, a sample from a 50 years old slab uh, and one of the structures being demolished. And we image that and to see the, uh, the distribution of the corrosion product inside this naturally corroded. And later on, we are going to investigate more of these and compare it to the accelerated corrosion that we are going to do in the lab in order to uh, draw uh, a good picture for the differences between the accelerated and uh, uh, naturally corroded uh, elements.
uh, as you can tell here, the concrete cover is being removed because of the uh, corrosion. So we don't have we don't have that much information on the concrete cover as it's been already uh, deteriorated and fall from the slab itself. Another example of the imaging work we did is the uh, asphalt samples where we investigate as well. We transfer the asphalt component into finite element model as is seen in the bottom uh, right of the slide. And the top left is basically the actual image of the, uh, of the asphalt beam. A wide range of material have been investigated in our imaging lab. For example, steel welding to see the gap between the two uh, pieces and the quality of the welding as well. Uh, shell rock analysis, which includes the voids and the gaps between different layers and the, and the rocks. Soil pollution samples to see the distribution of polluted elements inside these uh, uh, samples. Soft tissue characterization is one of the major uh, work that we're doing. And this includes the mechanical properties of in vivo uh, material properties, i.e. the potential to expand it to uh, living tissue material characterization using minimally invasive uh, elements. Our imaging help us to see the deformation inside these elements we investigated. We use hydrogel and we use ex vivo elements and we are expanding hopefully to the uh, in vivo one. Uh, wood samples, we take images of uh, uh, different sample of uh, woods and see the void distribution inside these elements. And in addition to that, we did some work on the composite bar, like the uh, basalt fiber reinforced polymer bars to see the distribution in of the fiber inside the bar uh, uh, and if there is any gap. And we, we have seen some uh, non-homogeneous distribution of the fiber within the epoxy. Uh, and the, we have many other applications for the imaging using different material. So the main message out of this uh, presentation is the integration of engineering and medical techniques has the potential to provide a great solution to a very complex problem in both fields. So we integrate mechanics into, from engineering into imaging from medical in order to resolve a very challenging problem and to name a few, to track cracks, to characterize mat soft material in very minimally invasive techniques uh, and to see the pollution distribution inside the soils and so on. I'd like to thank you for listening to our presentation with uh, I hope that we're giving you the clear picture of integrating different fields and the different concept from these fields into uh, one platform in order to solve some of the problems or challenges associated with medical and engineering uh, field. Please feel free to contact me if you have any question regarding the presentation or regarding any of the work that we are doing, including the uh, image mechanics integration lab and the surface associated uh, with this lab. Thank you.